Again, welcome to the AUC Data Science Initiative Seminar Series. My name is Talitha Washington, and I am going to kick us off with some announcements. So I am going to share my screen. And first, uh, welcome to the our Data Science Initiative Seminar. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day today, and I hope everything is going well. There's a lot happening. Uh, around the AUC and as far as in our country. We understand that it could be a trying time for some. And as we say, we, we at Clark Atlanta, we always say we find a way or we make one. Uh, so I just wanna encourage everybody to just stay steadfast, keep pushing forward. And we're gonna have amazing talk today on how to democratize data through the work of Dr. Stewart. So let me go ahead and pull up the slides here. One second, sorry about that, y'all. I'm just pulling them up. And if you could put in the chat where you're hailing from today. Um, I know we're hailing here from Atlanta, and I know some people are hailing from different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Okay, so you go ahead and put that in the chat and share that while I share my screen. There we go. And you have a pop-up poll that if you'd be so kind to uh, fill out. We first want to start off by thank you to our sponsors. And so in the month of November, uh, we are celebrating uh, one of our sponsors, MasterCard, who has really worked hard to make a global impact by empowering and equipping and motivating, most importantly, motivating organizations to do the good work of data. Um, so today, Dr. Stewart is going to talk about data.org, who works closely alongside MasterCard in a couple of weeks, we'll have Howard University talk about their work in the master's program in data science. That's also fueled by MasterCard. I first wanna start off by saying a big round of thank you uh, to all the students, coaches, industry mentors, and speakers. This past weekend, we had an Accelerate Your AI Unhackathon in collaboration with Vanderbilt University. And Vanderbilt brought a bus down to Atlanta and included students from Fisk and Tennessee State. We had students here from the AUC participate as well to look at how do you address misinformation and fraud uh, by creating an AI app to either detect or inform. It was a wonderful experience that happened this past weekend where the students created this AI app using Party Rock and really had a wonderful time. They wore me out, but they were amazing, an amazing presentation. So just a really good time had by all. And we're just thankful to Vanderbilt for their participation in pitching this um, unhackathon. So each of the students seems they developed an AI powered solution that addresses um, issues of misinformation and fraud. And they use a party rock, which is like one of those drag and drop block builder um, app builders. So if there's something that you'd like to do this weekend, you can have a party on Party Rock. Also, if you could, on November 16th, that's Saturday, November 16th, we're going to have round two uh, for our MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth uh, by DSI Data Challenge, where HBCU student teams will compete for over $50,000 in cash prizes. So just send up some good vibes on November 16th, if you would be so kind. Right now we're in that advising and can't believe it's almost um, holidays at the end of this month in December. Uh, so if anybody's interested in learning more about the uh, minors in the AUC, we have connections here shown on the screen at Clark Atlanta, Morehouse College and Spelman College. And we can send these slides out to you. I might be able to just upload it in the chat. We also just wanna give a, a high five uh, to Dr. King and her team. Dr. King is the deputy director here at the Atlanta University Center Data Science Initiative. And she's the lead PI on an NSF grant 
that integrates data science into social work undergraduate education. So we're excited about the work between that she's leading there along with her colleagues, Dr. Kim, Dr. Jones, Dr. Allison, who are all of social work, and Dr. Mandenhar, who's in uh, mathematical sciences, who really are pre creating and crafting, carefully crafting course modules on how to apply socially relevant data science and advance the field of social work by cultivating data-driven tools and addressing human and social issues. So I just want to give him a high five. I didn't ask, well, I did ask her. Uh, she said it was okay. I put uh, Du Bois on, his, on their team, uh, posthumous, as he was a faculty member here at Atlanta University who really looked at applying, addressing human and social issues through data. So really excited about the work that she is leading along with the team uh, to bring this. And this is the first NSF IU's grant. IU stands for Improving Undergraduate STEM Education uh, to Clark Atlanta University ever. So kudos for them uh, for being a first there at the illustrious CAU. On November 12th, Tuesday, November 12th at 12 noon, we have a lunch and learn with um, some really amazing speakers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who's gonna talk about how they're using and leveraging data at the CDC. So if you're interested in looking behind the scenes, how they're using it, uh, any and also potential job opportunities, uh, come on by. We'll have a virtual lunch uh, via Grubhub for all HBCU students, faculty, and staff. We are hiring, we have a jobs board. Uh, the jobs board is open for postings for our sponsors and also our HBCU friends. So if you'd like to post something on the jobs board, go for it. And also you can check it out. The We are reviewing applications for the NSF National Data Science Alliance Associate Director of Finance Administration. And uh, if you're interested in other opportunities, feel free to reach out. The NSF NDSA also has an opening for technical advisors for their two week on-site summer research workshop. So looking for those who can lead a research project uh, with HBCU faculty staff to accelerate the innovation of data science. If this is something of interest to you, again, feel free to reach out and I'll see if I can upload the slides in the chat and get those to you all. Without further ado, I just want to provide a, a brief well, maybe not so brief. Introduction for our amazing speaker. He has blown me away time and time again with his visions, with his insights and data, not just thinking about it at a local scale, but really thinking about how can we do a global impact through data to really amplify data for social good. He has more than two decades of experience in data science and artificial intelligence. Dr. Stewart is a trailblazer and has held several senior leadership positions in software development, digital solutions, public health oncology, with respect to cancer drug development strategy and technical program initiatives, applying AI and machine learning to develop solutions. He also has a deep fascination with innovation and science and an unrelenting tenacity, which I love, and passion for implementing real world solutions for sustainable outcomes and impact. Dr. Stewart is a fellow of the Cambridge Commonwealth Society and was appointed by IBM as a distinguished engineer for his pioneering work to co-lead IBM Research Africa and Niobe, the first commercial AI innovation and research lab in the continent. He was also appointed by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine as a member of Climate Crossroads Advisory Committees. He's an advocate champion for localizing AI and innovation hubs, for last mile delivery and adaptive ecosystem and has received numerous recognitions for his work in digital transformation to uplift the vulnerable and marginalized uh, communities. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stewart, who will be today's speaker. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And when he is either through or at the end, we will definitely come to those questions. And there's also a Q&A button you may press as well. Uh, Dr. Stewart? Yes, Dr. Washington. <laughs> Let me turn on my video. Uh, awesome. You're very kind. Thank you for that warm welcome and the intro. I am going to uh, share, I have a few slides uh, that are prepared for this presentation. Um, and as I bring it up, you're absolutely right, Dr. Washington. Um, 
uh, these are, there's a lot happening. Um, uh, but I like what you said. You know, we need you know at Clark, you find a way or make one, and I hopefully that's what we're going to do together today. Um, <clears throat> I, I would like to uh, start with a prologue. Um, you know, so when Dr. Washington reached out, she basically provides provided some guardrails uh, uh, for uh, to help me prepare for this presentation, and I and I want to use that as a prologue. Uh, my understanding is that the AUC Data Science Seminar Series showcases exciting and important and advancements in data science with a focus on topics that impact Black America. And I wanted to underscore that. So for anyone listening, uh, my key focus is really on the impact on Black America today uh, uh, from the perspective of, of AI. And what I hope to do is consistent with, with uh, the second guardrail on the slide here is to present some findings, hopefully uh, stimulate uh, uh, and inspire some thinking and, and, and ultimately uh, uh, provide opportunities for collaboration uh, with, with students and faculty. Uh, with that, uh, the, the focus of my, my, my short presentation um, is uh, on AI localism. And I want you to remember that phrase because I'm going to be coming back repeatedly to that phrase, AI localism. And I'm going to uh, motivate a, a community-centric approach um, to achieving inclusive AI from the perspective of data for social impact. That's the focus of my presentation today. But it's important to start with some um, uh, shared uh, uh, language, some collective understanding. And so I want to lay out uh, some of the uh, uh, premise uh, 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 for, for this talk. And they are predicated on three things. Uh, number one, like I said, is AI localism. And what does this mean? It's the idea that uh, the people closest to the issues on the ground should be equipped to develop AI solutions for their communities. And I'm going to come back to this example that I have on the screen today. Uh, the example is around empowering those in the, in the communities to generate content in their own language and in ways that are informed by local context and serve local priorities. Local, local, local. But, but the, the idea of AI localism itself is predicated on a fundamental assumption around lived experience. And lived experience uh, can be understood as the knowledge and understanding that is required for developing equitable and useful AI solutions that they should come from uh, personally experiencing something, right? And that it is based on someone's uh, personal histories and, and identities and, and beliefs and, and culture and, and worldview and perspectives. And the combination of, of AI localism and lived experience is how um, we advocate and advance for data uh, for social impact. Uh, because data, data for social impact itself is the use of data to more equitably and effectively uh, uh, benefit people uh, and communities and organizations and, and the environment. So it's a focus on uh, public good rather than deriving profit. And, and, and it applies across the board, right? It's not, uh, it's not just NGOs, right? It's, it's government and private sector. It's all of us to strive uh, for DSI, for do data for social impact. As Dr. Washington said, let's quickly address the elephant in the room, right? You know, the, there's a lot happening. And for marginalized and vulnerable communities, the struggle is real, right? I mean, this is a, a, short, a small sample of the issues that marginalized and vulnerable communities face today. Just pick, pick anyone. And this is just a, 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 my sampling. Right. Uh, let's take poverty. The, the 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 universal understanding of poverty is that you are broke, right? You can't make ends meet. Now the index for measurement may vary, right? You know, so if I am poor in Lagos, Nigeria, 
um, the index for measurement says that I live under two, less than $2 a day. And if I'm poor and broke in San Antonio, according to the World Bank Index or the uh, most recent US uh, 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 economic statistics, it means that I live under $73 a day. But it doesn't matter what the index is. If you're broke, you're broke. It's a universal thing. And so the point that I want to make on this slide is not just to draw attention to these things that affect vulnerable and marginalized communities. It's the cause, it's the trigger for these things, right? The cause and trigger for poverty or gender inequity, they are systemic. They arise from systemic inequities and barriers. And, and these are pervasive across low middle income countries. And notice the S, the S is in settings. Oftentimes when we hear LMICs, we think of Africa, we think of India, but in our work, there is poverty in the US, it's real, right? There's gender inequity in the US, it's real. So it's not just out there. For us, it's a global view when we talk about LMICs. And I'm gonna keep coming back to this again and again in my short presentation. And so I'm gonna keep using the phrase, it's a generic phrase, marginalized and vulnerable communities, right? So the question is, how can we address systemic barriers? irrespective of where you live in the world. There is hope, there is some silver lining, right? <laughs> uh, the silver lining um, uh, for many people uh, 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 who uh, uh, believe in the fourth industrial revolution comes from AI technologies. And in fact, universally, AI technologies have demonstrated the potential to create high impact interventions that can help to address some of these global systemic inequities and barriers that I flagged on the previous slide. But here is the problem, that the data and AI driven future that is being uh, powered uh, through the fourth industrial revolution is uneven, especially from the perspective of those who live in uh, low middle income countries and settings or marginalized and vulnerable communities. There is a, a global asymmetry. And so, yes, yes, esoterically speaking, AI can help, right? Only if it is done right. So what do, what do I mean by doing AI right? What does doing AI, AI right imply? Well, let's unpackage it a little bit. So I, I like to spend a few minutes to reflect on the current AI landscape. And I love this illustration here, right? Here is our reality when it comes to AI, right? Uh, and that's a picture on my far uh, left, I, I would imagine on your far right, right? The reality is that, you know, those who have continue to have and those who do not get, get nothing at all, right? It's an uneven, inequitable uh, distribution in terms of access and use of AI. And that's our reality. And that's just not fair, right? Well, equity, equality may be, you know, uh, may be useful, but it's not helpful because if you see the picture, the, 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 the person, the, the smaller person gets smaller and still cannot get part of the action, even from the perspective of equality. So please don't sell me equality. I think what we need to aspire to is to begin to look for ways to achieve equity. Maybe, maybe it's not a utopia to even imagine that we can have AI justice. Now, I'm not gonna get into AI justice today. I will stay within the realm of AI equity. The idea that everyone gets the support that they need so that we can now have a level playing field to be part of the action, right? What does that look like? Well, before I go into that, let me outline uh, three, maybe four challenges that get in the way of equity when it comes to AI or inclusive AI. The first one, oh my goodness, is this widening global asymmetry in terms of who and what is leading AI right now. Well, who's leading AI? A handful of companies, right? A handful of companies here in the US, 
and some in the in China. And, and by default, as a consequence, therefore, right, the, the AI, especially generative AI, is being powered and driven based on two languages as a consequence of those who are leading the development. Now, if we just pause, that itself is a, a, an alarming problem. And I'm trying to pick my words. <laughs> it's an alarming problem because there are more than 7,000 7, languages in the world, right? And for such a powerful technology that is transforming in the, the world to be predicated on two languages and by a handful of developer or developing organizations, that is as inequitable as it gets. And if you just stay on this slide alone, right? Uh, there is another problem. It is not just that it's being powered uh, by English and Mandarin. It's the consequence, is the counterfactual. The counterfactual is that 5 billion people now cannot have access to this technology. They are excluded. They can't contribute and they cannot benefit. There is one school of thought that says, oh, don't worry about it. We can always develop this in English and we can send it to them. Absolutely not. That's not equity. But that's our current reality. Here is another problem, right? It is the way that this technology is being developed, right? It is voracious. It is data hungry. Just to train one LLM, you need at least 1 billion tokens or parameters to create the tokenization that is involved in, in the LLM itself, right? And so what do the developers do? What do the leading organizations do? They, they kind of gravitate towards where the data is and the data is on the internet, right? They scrub the internet for everything that is available. But that process, that approach itself is creating a dichotomy, is creating an exclusion because majority of the world's languages are not digitized and therefore they are not available on the internet. And so you now have this amazing asymmetry and contrast, right? A, a digital divide that is now defined in terms of high resource languages, namely those that are available online and low resource languages, which is those that are not digitized because those languages cannot come online. But it's not even just that, it's more than that. It's, it's more than the resources or digitization is the derivative components of what it means to be a high resource language versus what it means to be a low resource language. Let's look at some of them. If you're a high resource language, it means that you have lots of linguistic resources and human and technology support. There are large collections of digitized text. You have well-developed NLP uh, 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 tools and resources uh, and all, of, all that you need in order to make your language uh, 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 digitally uh, responsive to the citizens. But if you're in no, low resource uh, language or in no, low resource settings, it's the inverse. Few to zero linguistic resources in terms of human and technology capacity, right? And there's very little digitization in terms of text or recorded speech, and also by default or consequence, very limited NLP resources. This is the reality. This is why AI inclusion right now is a utopia, unless we do something about it. And in the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk about what we collectively, as a community, we can do. Hence, in my title, I talked about a community-centric approach. But, but, but one more thing before I go into solutioning, and, and please bear with me, I need, to, I need to complain a little bit, because it's annoying what is happening, right? <laughs> so, so, because of this uh, um, um, uh, focus and push to get data from, from, from the internet, right? There is this um, uh, very myopic one-sided approach by technologists to imagine that once you have the data, then you can build useful, usable AI solutions. On this slide, I want to pump the brakes on that approach. And I want to strongly posit that it's not just about the data that AI is socio-technical. Because if you go back to the canonical definition of artificial intelligence, 
it is an approach to mimic human intelligence. And if it, is, if it is, therefore, it should be more than data. It should also be about the language, the culture, the worldview, the belief, the lived experiences, that accumulation. Little wonder, right? In the early 1960s, it, when uh, behavioral sciences just began to be a thing, especially here in the US, there was a lot of movement uh, either around an ethnography of communication by Delheims or in uh, generative linguistics by Chomsky, right? To start to make a distinction between communicative competence and communicative performance. In a nutshell, what does this mean? When I know a language, that's just one part of it. My ability to use a language in a way that reflects the nuances, what young people call nuanced, right? That is all of those ambiguities, the culture, the, the, the environment of use, that's performance. Right now, that's missing in current uh, uh, generative AI solutions out there. And here is a little example. Now, this is just my example, because we can even look at just English here in the US and ask ourselves, for the mom and pop that live in the South, right, uh, especially in the Black community, right, that speak a, a, a dialect that we call a, 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 a black English. Is that captured in current AI systems? So I'm not so I'm using an African language example, but I would like you to, to come on this journey with me. That exclusion uh, is truly universal. Because a lot of the nuances in the languages that we speak are not captured in the mainstream data that is being used to power this this technology. And so right in the middle, you find a few examples of experiments that we co uh, conducted with some of the conversational AI systems out there, looking at things like uh, tonality in African languages, looking at things like uh, uh, proverbs or idioms or symbolisms or parables or innuendos, slags, metaphors, sarcasm, irony. These things that make up how we speak, these things that make up who we are, they are being left out in the data that is collected to power modern day AI uh, solutions. It's not just an African thing. It's not just an Indian thing. It's universal. And I think that's my point. And so let me stop complaining if you don't mind. <laughs> I got it off my chest. <laughs> so let's go to quickly to solutions. So how can we work together to build AI solutions that center um, equity that provide access that ensure inclusion for those who are excluded right now. This is where I go back to the title of my talk. It's one phrase. It's all centered and predicated on AI localism. And what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is to begin to take you through components of a community centric approach to achieving inclusive AI. Before I do that, let me briefly introduce my organization. And I want to uh, um, give a public shout out to MasterCard, just like Dr. Washington did. MasterCard has been a tireless champion for, uh, uh, for achieving, for promoting and achieving inclusive AI. Uh, they've, they've, they've backed a lot of our work, uh, just like they are back, back in the AUC and we are grateful. And so we were set up uh, five years ago, uh, roughly five years ago, uh, uh, by MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth and Rockefeller Foundation uh, as a platform for global partnerships to bring together right, uh, uh, philanthropic organizations, the private and public sector, universities, social impact organizations, bring everyone together, which is why I'm so fired up talking to you today, right? that we can all work together to accelerate the power of data and AI to solve some of the pressing global challenges that we have. As an organization, we think globally, but we, th we advance and strongly believe in the principle of localism as we build the field of data and AI for social impact. We have a, a quantitative metric um, to measure success. And, and that, that metric is that at the, by 2032, that we would have worked with all of these organizations, including those who are listening to me right now, to train 1 million purpose-driven data practitioners around the world, with 50% of them coming from low uh, middle income countries and settings from marginalized and vulnerable communities. But as we do this organizationally, 
we are also mindful that we have to be responsible. We have to be demure, right? We have to make sure that as we train and provide unprecedented access to technology, that we do not allow a new digital divide to emerge, as I have already explained in the last few minutes. And the way we combat and counteract this new digital divide um, uh, is from three perspectives. One is that we, we invest uh, in training talent, what we call workforce development. Like I said, AI localism is about those who are closest to the problem being the ones to develop solutions for those problems. That's why number one for us is talent development. And we partner with uni universities to do that. The second is it's not enough uh, to just train people. You got to give them the right tools. It's not enough for me to get on this call and say that AI is socio-technical without providing them the tools for achieving such socio-technical outcomes. So we also build digital public goods. And finally, we are aggressive in addressing the data divide, as I have talked about. That's uh, who we are as an organization. Very quickly, let me give you some examples of the work that we're doing. On the talent side, uh, in capacity building, uh, we have what we call the Capacity Accelerator Network. And, and our goal here is to produce a new kind of data scientist that believes in a localism, um, that believes in pragmatic approach to socio-technical uh, 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 implementation of AI, but focuses not just on a formulaic data science, that is, you know, not just on probability distribution as a formula, but probability distribution that actually reaches an outcome to solve a problem that is true data for social impact, right? And, and you can see in the middle of the screen uh, uh, right here that, that again, thanks to MasterCard and other uh, uh, funders, we already have a global footprint. We have developed a global architecture, right, for uh, training and implementing capacity building around the world, both here in the US, in Latin America, across uh, many countries in Africa, in India, and, and later in two weeks, we're actually just branching out to Southeast Asia. And the way we do this is to partner with universities, uh, private sector organizations, like I said, which is in our mandate, to bring them together to achieve the three things that I outlined. This is our work in, in, in talent development. Given the success that we've had, um, we are now beginning to think about how do we scale this? How do we scale the architecture that we have created for, for training? And this is what we have now coined around the Global Data for Social Impact Network. Put simply, this Global Data for Social Impact Network allows us to bring many others, including Clark University and all of the HBCUs into this architecture that we've already created so that we can all work together, right? And make a way or find a way together to use data for social impact, yeah? So, so how do you become a member of the Global Data for Social Impact Network? It's very simple. On our website, and I'm going to send this the slides uh, out to Dr. Talitha, to all of you, right? On our website, we have a charter. It's very simple. We've created a low barrier for entry, right? You read the charter. It's everything I've talked about, to believe in AI localism, to believe in empowering the community, to be the best equipped to address local uh, uh, challenges, right? You read the charter. If you agree with those tenants of DSI, you send an email to this email on the screen, join Global DSI Network, and you are in, period. That's it. It's a low barrier to entry for organizations who want to be part of this. So if you are listening to me, you ask, so what could organization, what could your organization uh, benefit? You become part of this global movement. You pioneer this global movement to train 1 million purpose-driven data practitioners around the world by 2032. What a noble DSI goal. You become part of that, right? To achieve equity when it comes to AI. But also, um, you don't have to be a member to get access to our resources, but then you can get you know, into some gated communities uh, if, if those were to exist. So you get DSI resources on our platform, but here is really the biggest thing you get. You become part of a global network. If you forget everything I have said, we have a collective lived experience, all of us, all of us that are marginalized and vulnerable. And so we can help each other. So there will be relationships between uh, HBCUs here in the US 
and universities in India and in Africa working together to promote data for social impact. That's the biggest thing you get for being part of this network. And what do we expect from you? Very simple, that when you create curriculum, so you're not just taking, but when you create curriculum, you also contribute into the network so that we can all, in the true spirit of Ubuntu, that we can all work and live together. But more than that, more than just training, right, and creating curriculum, is also to ensure that we work together to put the right guardrails in place for AI localism and to achieve inclusive AI. For that, we are promoting two, two, two uh, ideas. One is around data equity and data quality and data access. All the things that I talked about on the language front earlier on, right? That's what we call the data equity, data quality, and data access issues. So that 5 billion people can actually be brought online and be beneficiaries of AI uh, and also have the ability to contribute. And then also it's important, right, that as we advance and embrace this amazing technology, that we do not neglect the aspects of what it means to be demure, to be mindful, to be responsible. That is the aspects of ethics, right? To ensure that this technology does not do harm to the communities, right? To ensure that even as we train data scientists, that we are not creating a glut in the market, that we are thinking creatively, demurely about uh, job opportunities, just like Dr. Washington mentioned uh, in her announcements earlier on. As I conclude, let me give you just one example um, of, of, so, of one, one project that is already going on with members of the DSI network. And I'd like to pause again. I don't know if anyone from MasterCard is on this call, but data.org, and all of the sub-grantees uh, for this project are grateful that as you continue to promote and support uh, uh, our strive uh, uh, towards inclusive AI. And so in this project, there are three things we are doing. One, it's um, to, to um, impact uh, what we call data equity and data quality by reimagining data uh, collection so that the models that that are used, the, the data that is used to generate the AI models themselves have the right data variables. That is, they are truly representative. The underlying models are representative. So we are thinking about how do you reimagine data collection, especially for communities where a lot of the data uh, is indigenous and tribal knowledge, where a lot of the data is in oral, in, in speech, right? How do you collect that? So we're, we're creating a playbook uh, to, to, to address that. Then as part of this work in this project, um, we're also thinking about how can we enable the roughly 7,000 languages that are not digitized? How can we enable members of this community to digitize their languages? What does that look like? How do you collect data, right? What does that look like? And then how do you go from data to generating small language models or large language models? What is the process? What are the steps? And what are the tools required, right? So, so it's not just data science for data science sake, but it's data science that empowers the community to be able to help bring their languages online. And finally, um, uh, in this playbook, it's about training, right? How do we bring training in a way that is locally relevant to the communities, to the practitioners, so that they are not just beneficiaries of AI? My goodness. No, that they can also be contributors to AI. In this fourth industrial revolution, those who live in marginalized and vulnerable communities cannot just be takers. They also have to be givers. But the only way to be givers is to be trained and skilled in the art of development. And that's part of what this playbook uh, covers. And so those are the four chapters that, that you see on the screen. And again, grateful to MasterCard. That project is just kicking off. It's one example of what we're doing in the network. The outcome of this, and I'm going to speed through this very simply, uh, is that starting from the work that we're doing in India and expanding that work you know, through some, some of our partners in Nigeria and then generalizing it through the continent of Africa, we're able to train almost 10,000 data, new data practitioners, right? Just from this one, just this one component of the network alone. And, and, and then the playbook itself not only trains 10,000 practitioners, but we're gonna make it available online in our uh, resource library and, and to the communities on the ground, both in India and Africa, so that they can feed themselves. 
they can learn how to digitize their languages. Uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what what uh, uh, what this project is all about, and it's just about to kick off, and and there will be a quick turnaround um, in a few months where we start to uh, share chapters of this uh, of the playbook with members of the network, and and as a digital public good to everyone else. Let me wrap up to conclude, and this is my epilogue. Through the Global DSI Network, we're building a global coalition, especially across marginalized and vulnerable communities to help scale local capacities in universities, innovation hubs, governments, et cetera, so that we can work together to facilitate AI localism, as I've outlined so far in my presentation. And there's a universal backing for this, right? Recently, the United Nations uh, Secretary General's uh, High Level Advisory Board on AI report recommends that there should be the creation of a global AI capacity development network that offers training, compute resources, and AI data sets to researchers and social entrepreneurs. Oh my goodness, they are late because that's exactly what the global DSI network is all about. The coalition we're building, especially across the global south, is to help scale local capacity in universities, right? So that they can facilitate, we can facilitate the use of data and AI to tackle the greatest local challenges. I'll now pause to invite organizations who are listening in real time or who will listen later on uh, 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 asynchronously to please, you know, reach out and be part of this network so that as Dr. Clark said, said it at the start, that we can find a way or make one together. With that, I thank you all for listening and I'm ready to take questions. That was wonderful and inspiring. Thank you so much. So at this time, if you have some questions, go ahead and put it in the chat or you can also hit the Q&A button. Uh, Dr. Stewart, you can relax and you can stop sharing your screen if you'd like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off the poll results. Um, so are you a currently enrolled student? We have 17% who are currently enrolled and also 83% who have graduated. We're going to definitely share the YouTube link with our students in the data challenge because I think this uh, presentation really will be helpful. I, I know I'm inspired. So most of our students are, are sophomore, seniors, master's, PhD. And for gender distribution, we have 43% female and 57% male. And where do you currently live? About half live in Georgia and half not in Georgia. So those who are near, welcome to Atlanta and far, welcome to Atlanta. One of our questions was, what percentage of Fortune 500 companies currently use generative AI? And was it 17%, 35%, 74% or 92%. Most people said 74%. That's interesting. 43% of the respondents said 40, 74%. Well, it's 92%. Uh, so it's so a little bit higher uh, than one anticipated. Uh, which of these statements is true? 80% of women are employed in fields vulnerable to automation by generative AI. 89.2% of artists believe that current copyright laws are inadequate in the age of generative AI. 90% of online content could be generated by AI by the end of next year. Uh, most people said it was the second one that 89.2% of artists believe that current copyright laws are inadequate in the age of generative AI. That is true. And also the others are true as well. Trick question. 80% uh, of women are employed in fields uh, vulnerable to automation by generative AI. And it's also true that 90% of online content could be generated by AI by the end of next year. So it definitely will transform uh, how we do business if, if at any point. And um, let's see, someone put in the chat, they asked the question, is this language inequity existing in computer science at large and not just in AI development? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to take the more popular thing, AI development, but that's that's a, an indication to something I said, I think on slide number three, the systemic inequities that we have, 
right? You know, so the AI is just a, a tip of the iceberg. They are systemic, it's across the board. So the answer is yes. And so somebody asked me the other day, they said, uh, uh, is industry ready to have, I'll say AI skilled, but diverse talent? And I said, well, I hope so. <laughs> as well as higher education. But so I'm going to ask you that question that was asked me. I, I, you probably, you will answer it better than I did. So is industry ready for diverse talent who is skilled in AI? Yes, they, but I'll flip it the other way. And and I and I don't mean to, to, to do this to you, but our university is producing, right, the right kind of students that the industry is looking for, which is a part of my message today, right? That, that, that AI and the and development of AI cannot be formulated. There are smart people who know the math, but do not understand the context and how to do the development. And so what we need to do is to work together and, and create a new kind of training, which is what I'm talking about. Now I'm gonna get super excited again, right? <laughs> so, so, so is the own industry ready? The answer is yes, but we are not giving them what they need, mm. right? And, and, and look, I, I used to teach as well, uh, Dr. Dr. Washington, right? It takes a while for the Senate to approve changes to a course, right? And the industry is running and needs X, Y, and Z. Are we catching up? And that's why in our approach, in our approach, it's not close. We work with universities, we work with innovation hubs, we work with you know, the private sector to come together. So there is a hybrid commingling so that we can actually have students ready for the industry. Long-winded answer, but I hope I, I answered your question. Oh, that was amazing. So what do student, students need to do or to know to be ready for this, this, I'll say, AI industrial revolution? Yes. So it's a great, that, that's a fantastic question. So <laughs> there are, if I want to put it simplistically, right, um, there's this, age old tension that we have in computer science between who is technical and who is not, right? Uh, and, and, and as a result, we have closed the computer science and the development of innovative ideas to those who really understand context, understand lived experience, understand culture, the, the social scientists, the, the sociologists, the ethnographers, we've just locked them out, right? And, and, and what we're doing is to let's relax, let's let's open up the because the greatest solution really is one that comes from a hybridation of skills. So there will be a component where there is a math, but it's a component where there is the context, which is the, the socio-technical coming together to produce the best solutions for the community. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Someone put in the chat, that is the question. Are we developing enough of diverse talent? And, and I'll say domestic talent, I, I think people are saying nowadays. And then how do we ensure this given the, the recent um, decisions that have been uh, made this past week? We don't rely solely on affirmative action, but it's still important to be cognizant of who's at the table and who's not and, and having equitable approaches for everyone. And the person goes on to say, we don't rely solely on title programs in K-12 schools, but they are important to address systematically created um, gaps. So what are your insights for those who, who many of us will say got thrown uh, this week as far as like, well, what do we do now? Uh, there yeah. seems to be, let's, let's not say words that start with D, E, or I, but how can we reframe it so we still stay empowered and, and achieve goals that really provides equitable access across all communities? Absolutely. It's, I don't have a great answer. I mean, because we were all just <laughs> with, <laughs> okay. All right. Let me stay. <laughs> yes. We, so I don't have a great answer, but I've been thinking about it, um, you know, um, and um, one of the things that I, I think that my organization, uh, is missing right now is uh, we're working with uh, organizations such as yours, uh, Dr. Washington, uh, but we are focusing on the tertiary uh, level. Um, and I think we need to sort of look down a little bit. We need to look the K to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 
you know, you know what's funny? <laughs> you know what's amazing? Um, the, the areas that we are of the world that we actually look down on, they get it. Do you know that kids in K through 12 in Nigeria, in Kenya, can actually code right now? Because in these places, they're not calling it computer science. They understand that there's got to be something that needs to happen in order to prepare the workforce for the workforce of the future. So they're not waiting for universities, right? And so we can learn from that, right? We can begin to work, you know, whether it's tutorials, whatever we do, uh, and if we can influence um, the school board to begin mm -hmm. to enable our children K through 12 to start to think about this sooner than later. That's a community-centric approach. I, I love that. Because a lot of our students are doing this. I remember when I was a, a knee high to a grasshopper, way younger, and I uh, we had a computer in the hall. I, I must have been middle school, and I, I just sat down and, and made four loops for fun, right? So it was straight up DOS, you know, with the, I don't know if it was yellow, green, or, or, or black, white font. Uh, but it, I would just create four loops just, just to play around with it. And I find that students are more um, agile to kind of jump in. Like when we did our AI and hackathon this past weekend, it really was the unhackathon that everybody comes. There were some computer science folks and there were folks that didn't do computer science and there were folks that never did AI, but it was, let's come in and really think about this and have all the voices at the table thinking yeah. about how we can create solutions. And so I, I totally agree with you that we just relax. And, right. and have everybody at the table. And so somebody said, and I, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Brian Cox, who's here. He's the lead computer science program specialist in the D Georgia Department of Education, who's awesome and amazing. And so he's done a lot of work in broadly participation in computer science um, here in the state of Georgia. So I just want to give a high five uh, to Dr. Brian Cox there. And uh, he says, how do we inspire young people K-12 to explore literacies and careers in AI and data science. So how do you entice that, that career pathway? Um, so it's, uh, I, 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 I don't have young kids at home anymore, but uh, they, they, the mind of, of, of those in K through 12 is amazing. Um, it has to be a problem centric approach. Um, what do I mean? Rather than teaching the formula, the formula turns people off. But if you tell them that, you know what, um, here is the problem, that we have gender inequity in America and we are looking for solutions, they, they would amaze you. So, so what I'm saying is that we need to reimagine re uh, how we approach uh, the teaching of this concept at that level, right? There is this very uh, co uh, computerized formulaic approach, procedural approach. And in our work, we are saying, because AI is socio-technical, let's move away from that. It's, 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 mm -hmm. a, it's embedded, but it does not have to be at the forefront. Let's have them focus on, can we solve problems, right? What is the problem we're trying to solve, right? What should we be aware of? When you expose young people to that, and I've seen it happen in hackathons, they would amaze you in terms of the ideas they come up with. And before you know it, just by doing it, they learn the uh, uh, rudimentary aspects of computer science. Yeah, I, I love that. Solving problems and challenges and, and how can we and looking and exploring. Fantastic. And so Brian says, I got it. It matters how you frame it or pair it. Yes, sir. Yes, it, and using, using the student language and, and the student perspective. Um, yeah. Some students... It's. I would say it is good to eat, and obviously the funding is there. But you get to solve some really cool, fun problems, That's and right. come in different areas. So it says computer science in the United States, like Georgia, is an elective, and students aren't choosing these courses in large numbers. And then I'll probably I would like to add on that in Georgia, I forgot what the Senate bill was at the state level, but they wanted to have computer um, science courses in every school throughout the state. I'm not sure whatever happened with that uh, um, Senate bill, but how, so how do we think about enticing students to kind of dive into computer science or maybe we need to, computer science education is new. Maybe we need to rethink and have it, have different, uh, we'll say options or to, to dive into computer science. 
I tell you what we did. Uh, this is a long time ago. So I was a professor at the University of British Columbia. So I've, I've been uh, championing this for a while, uh, Dr. Washington. So <laughs> this is a long, almost two decades ago. And he asked me this same question. And, and I said, uh, let's think about um, a general a gen ed course, right? Um, uh, we and, and at the UBC we call it foundations. We just call it foundations. And, and what we did in the class was basically, um, a, so let's say, uh, Dr. Washington, you and I will get in uh, into the classroom and have a healthy debate, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, you are a mathematician uh, par excellence, right? But <laughs> I'm a computational linguist. I, I do natural language processing, right? How can we, and we get into the class, we don't create any curriculum, but we, we are giving topics. That's why it's called foundations. And before the students, we agree to disagree. And you see students beginning to take sides, they get into it and, it, and, and out of that comes term papers. It was just a radical way of introducing students into computer science by having professors be vulnerable, right? We are not holier than thou. We are not cathedral, right? Be vulnerable and then bring them into it. I'm sorry, I'm just so, I'm, I'm like a kid in the candy store. I'm eating all of this up. <laughs> I love that. That is amazing and great ideas. And we'll just end with this last question. How can an individual get involved with data.org? I did put a link to your LinkedIn a profile and also to data.org, but like who should they reach out to? How do, how do, they, how do they get a, a part of this movement? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, for, for this movement to scale, it has to be organizational, right? You know, it cannot be bespoke individual. So I, I, I know that's not the answer that the person is looking for, but I would encourage the person to uh, spread the word, go bug your organization, tell them we want to be part of this network. And then at the organizational level, because we want to scale, right? And then the organization comes in and brings individuals along. That's how we are achieving scale. So it's open, it's low barrier to entry, but it's at the organizational level. Wonderful. And this individual is at, at the amazing Prairie View A&M University. And so I know there are definitely have some really cool AI, data and AI initiatives there. And so I would say maybe Prairie View would like to join in uh, and maybe encourage them. If you need contacts, let me know. I've got some good friends there. Uh, but yes, and I agree. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, Dr. Stewart. I myself am, am re-motivated. And it, this was a nice recharging for a, an interesting week on multiple counts. And thanks again for all of that, your work that you're doing globally to enhance it and just really push for data for social good because we all need it. So thanks everybody for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.